Mo. It is April 6th, and that means it's time for another monthly reading wrap-up done vlog style where I talk about each book that I've read during the month, and I try to do that as close to when I've read the book as possible so it turns into a super long vlog where we get to talk all about all the books that I read each month. In April I have read two books so far, and the first book that I finished in April was Death in a White Tie by Niall Marsh. Niall Marsh is a New Zealand author who was a contemporary of Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, and she was writing crime fiction in Britain for most of her life. She is definitely considered one of the queens of crime. She has a famous detective, Chief Inspector Allen. That is her most well-known stories, although she wrote other books. This is the first book I've ever read by her, and I just happened to find it in a little free library. I love this cover. It is quite a chunky book, coming in at 350 pages, and it does follow her most famous detective, Inspector Allen. This is the seventh book in the Inspector Allen series, and it was written in 1938. I think it's one of those series similar to Miss Marple or Poirot that you can read them out of order. It probably does help to read them in order, but reading them out of order isn't that big of a deal. This book follows Inspector Allen as he is caught up in a blackmailing case. He lives in the upper crust society of England and some of the fancy ladies there are getting blackmailed. He enlists his friend, who is beloved by all, to help him in this blackmail scheme, but things do not go as planned and Allen friendships, his loyalties to his family and friends in this upper crust society are all questioned when a shocking murder occurs alongside all of the blackmail. I really wanted to love this book and I wanted to find a, another golden age mystery writer that I could really get into their whole canon and backlist and there was just something off about this book for me. I didn't love it. I certainly didn't hate it. There was nothing wrong with it. And there were many aspects that I did like, but it was not as gripping and compelling, as engrossing and engaging as, for instance, Agatha Christie. Now, is it fair to compare all Golden Age mysteries to Agatha Christie? Possibly not, because as we all know, Agatha Christie really is the queen of crime, and she is an amazing author that, if you like her style, you're always going to be comparing other books to her. I thought that this book was overly long, but there didn't seem to be anything that you could really cut out. Like, it didn't seem to have extraneous passages or long-winded descriptions in my mind, but it just felt so slow and plodding. I have read some Golden Age mysteries that were like that. The novel I read by John Bood comes to mind, but this had all the markers and possibilities of being a really intriguing, fast-paced, exciting mystery, and it just wasn't an exciting mystery. It was an interesting mystery, and I liked that Inspector Allen was faced with having to come to terms with his relationships with many people in this book. He has a love interest that obviously he's dealt with in other cases and in past books that comes back into play in this one, which was interesting. He has friends that possibly were in other books or other cases. His loyalties are very split. He's a police officer first and he must catch the crime, but because he is so embroiled in these people's lives, it's difficult for him to separate. And I think that was interesting to see in a detective story, because that's not usually the case, right? It's usually an outside observer or a very removed person or someone like Miss Marple who, although she insinuates herself into every case, is always standing apart from everyone. She's always watching them and never giving of herself. Whereas these people know Inspector Allen, they're all in this together in a lot of ways, and he uses his connections to be able to manipulate people certainly, but also to 
have them help him. He's very much a learning teacher, which you know I love, and so he is always asking for advice, asking people what they think, trying to come up with possibilities that maybe he hasn't seen. I enjoyed that about this book. Again, I didn't hate it, but it just didn't have that like amazing spark. If you have read any Nayo Marsh, please let me know what books I should be reading. Should I be reading these books in order? Are there standalone novels that I should be reading? Is this, although her most famous detective, not her best work? Let me know in the comments below. The next book that I read in April is Piranesi by Susanna Clark. I was super interested in Piranesi when I first started hearing about it, and then it won the Women's Prize in 2021, and I was even more interested in it. Piranesi is on my 20 21 books I found out about in 2021 that I want to read in 2022. So I have ticked another book off of that list. Which for April is not bad, having two off the list. That's pretty good. Piranesi is about a person who lives in a labyrinth. It is a house and it is also the world. There is water in the house, there is sky, there is birds, there are statues in this house, and our main character spends his time traveling around the world both to clothe, feed, and shelter himself, and also to explore the world, which is also the house, so that he can map the world and know everything about it. Our main character considers himself a scientist and has a scientific mind when dealing with the house. Mm. There are others that our main character interacts with. This book deals with the main character's life and his exploration of the house, which is also the world, and his interaction with these other people. That's a pretty vague synopsis, and I think we'll leave it at that because there's not a lot you can say about this book. It's very short. I read this book on audio. It was read by Tweedle Olgiafor. It was a great reading. It's a good book, I think, to read in like one or two sittings. That's not how I read it, but I definitely plan on finding this book used at some point and rereading it physically. Although I really loved the narration, I think reading this book physically and straight through would be a great way to read this one. I really enjoyed this book. I really enjoyed how quirky and odd and out of time and place it is. You're not sure in this book whether it's magical realism, whether it's fantasy, whether it's another world, whether it's our world. You're never sure what is safe and good and what is scary and nefarious. So there's a lot of interesting unsettling elements to this book, but overall I think it is a more content book. Not necessarily happy, but not scary or sad, even though there are unsettling moments. This book reminded me a lot of The Raw Shark Texts by Stephen Hall. That's one of my all-time favorite books, and it has a lot of the same themes of reality versus unreality, of new worlds, of uh, labyrinths and mazes, and whether you can trust your mind or if you do trust your mind but people are telling you that you can't, whether you still can. So if you read Piranesi and you liked Piranesi, I would highly recommend you go out and read the Raw Shark texts. I said basically the same thing that I just said to you now in a vlog that I am working on. This vlog is going to be reading three books from the Women's Prize, so if you want to check that out, it will probably come out after this reading wrap-up. But those are the two books that I've read in April so far, and uh, when I read some more, I'll let you know. It is April 7th. It's my dad's birthday, and I have finished one more book in April, and it is my first NY book review book for NY Book Review Month that Rick McDonnell is putting on. It is To Each His Own by Leonardo Schiazia. This is a modern classic Italian translated novel and it was translated by Adrian Folk. It was originally written in 1968 and it is a crime mystery book to a certain extent. This 
starts out with a pharmacist who receives a death threat. And initially he's a little bit worried about this death threat, but since he's a pretty upstanding citizen and since he has committed no crimes, this death threat, which basically says you're gonna be dead by next week, doesn't bother him that much and he brushes the whole thing off as a joke. And the town who often comes into his pharmacy and hangs out, I believe it's like kind of one of those pharmacies that also has like a counter where you can get sodas and stuff like that. That's how I pictured it anyway. Follow his lead and brush the death threat off as well. But the following week when hunting season opens and he and his doctor friend go hunting and both are shot dead along with one of the hunting doctors dogs, everyone realizes that this death threat was much more serious than they had originally thought. The main character is a good friend of the doctor who was unfortunately murdered alongside the pharmacist, and he starts to kind of pick apart some of the clues and trails that he has seen in this case. He's a high school teacher and he works in the city even though he lives in the town, and he just kind of idly investigates what's happening. In his investigation he talks to many different people related with both the pharmacist and the doctor, and he starts to find more more and more evidence that this crime was much deeper and more nefarious, more planned out, and had a lot more political intrigue than he originally thought. At the same time, his good friend, the doctor's wife, is mourning, and he comes to kind of get a crush on her, and that spurs on his want to solve this crime. So this was a really interesting book because it definitely starts out with a focus on the pharmacist and then we move on to the teacher and then we move on to other people kind of in the last little bit of the book. So it's interesting the way the progression is and I thought this was an interesting book as far as like a mystery goes as well because it is such a casual mystery. The teacher is investigating this mystery over a lot of time and he's often led to clues just by happenstance. He'll happen to run into someone who also knew his good friend the doctor and they'll tell him a little tidbit of information maybe months after the crime was committed and he'll kind of store that away into his investigation. It has a lot to do with politics and fascism and and communism of the time and what was going on politically in specifically Sicily at that time because all these characters are Sicilian. So it also has a little bit to do with the, since the Sicilian mentality and the kind of stereotypes or reliable generalities that Sicilians are held to and hold themselves to. And it has a little bit to do also with like the naivete of the amateur sleuth which I enjoyed. There's kind of the idea that he, although the teacher is investigating these things, he doesn't really want to like get the police onto the criminal. He just thinks that he can solve this case, so he wants to do it. But he's not doing it necessarily for moral reasons. He is interested because, again, the doctor was his good friend, and he does want to know what happened, but he's not really doing it to bring this criminal to justice, so that's an interesting idea as well. And then, of course, that amateur sleuthing puts him in danger, that idle fascination with crime, and the, the lead up to being in danger yourself is an interesting idea. Overall, I really enjoyed this book. It's very, very short, only 158 pages, and it has that thing that modern classics have that I just love. I love books written between, say, the 40s and the 80s, and I love that idea of modern classics. This had some flowery aspects to the language, but overall it's a very straightforward story told in a straightforward way. There's just something very clean and to the point that I enjoy and admire about those kind of books. This was the third book that I've read in April, and when I read some more I'll let you know. It is March 12th and I have finished one more book. I finished Season of Migration to the North by Taib Salih. This is a Sudanese modern classic and one of the New York Review books. This one I actually 
very recently got. I got it last week at the Asbury Park Book Cooperative, which is the local bookstore in my town. It was used, and they usually have a few books in the NYRB line, which I really like. They actually had like five or six when I went to find it, but they were all nonfiction and they were all books that were like either very heavy sounding or very long and I wasn't interested in any of them, but I was super interested in this. I thought that this might be a mystery crime type book similar to his to each his own. And it sort of is. This follows a young Sudanese man returning to his home village in Sudan right on the curve of the Nile after seven years away in England. He has been studying at university. He's learned a lot from the British culture and although he's happy to come back to his Sudanese home and upbringing. He definitely feels changed by his experience of being with the British. When he comes home, he sees that there is a man who he doesn't recognize and he starts asking all sorts of people in the village about this man and it turns out that this man, Mustafa, came to the village a few years ago and he bought a farm. He started farming and becoming part of the community, becoming part of the council. He took a wife, he's had two sons, and he's just known as a outsider, but a very even keel, nice man who is helpful, quiet, calm. Our main character can't quite reconcile that man with the description that his villagers, his fellow villagers and his friends are giving him. There's something about Mustafa that he thinks is a little off. And one night when Mustafa speaks in English, our main character decides that he really needs to learn Mustafa's backstory. He needs to learn all about where this man came from and why he ended up in the village and why he ended up in the lifestyle that he did. So this book starts out very linear, very straightforward, even paced. And when the main character starts to talk to Mustafa and starts to learn his backstory and the secrets of his life, the book itself starts to change. It starts to become uneven, become unrooted in time. It starts to become a little bit untethered. And the more that our main character learns about Mustafa and the more repercussions come from that knowledge, the more the book becomes disjointed and becomes unsteady. It gives you a feeling of unease. And I think that's the intent of the book, but it made for a very strange reading experience. I really enjoyed the first part of the book. I enjoyed learning about our main character. I enjoyed learning about Mustafa and his history. It is a disturbing history. It's also mysterious, so you definitely want to know and find out what happens. And then as the story unravels, so does the book unravel. It was a little bit jarring. Overall, I definitely really enjoyed this book, and I think that once I got over that initial shock, I definitely think that that was an intentional writing device, and I think that it did lend itself to feeling very uneven, unbalanced in the story, which was interesting. I really appreciated and liked the look at Sudanese life. This book was written in 1969, so definitely a while ago. It was interesting to hear about how the people in the Sudanese village were using innovations in farming, looking forward to innovations in education, and how they were feeling a little bit left behind by the government. This is post-colonization of Sudan, so there was quite a bit of talk about how while they were colonized, things were not good for the Sudanese people, but at least things were working properly. Now that the Sudanese government was in place, 
they felt that the government was really not suiting them or serving them in the way that they needed and our main character ends up becoming a civil servant and this book follows several years so as he's a civil servant he's also going back and forth from the main city where his job is to his small village and he's seeing the progress that the villagers are making and how Mustafa was part of that because he was part of a lot of the village committees that were utilizing these innovations you know water wheels for irrigating crops and other important things how they want a school and they want to make sure that their children can get to school in a reasonable amount of time and that they're not traveling far very interesting look at that era of time and post-colonization and the idea of what the villagers want but that the government isn't giving them and the way that these characters tie into that it also has a lot to do with madness almost and how once we learn Mustafa's story and how he was raised and then how he became a young adult how he traveled the world and how he was gripped by a love of women but the conquering of women how that was almost like a madness that gripped him and then our main character kind of follows a very similar path and it's almost as if by learning Mustafa's story and the madness that he went through our main character is gripped by madness as well and the story descends that makes it sound very dramatic and I don't think it was quite as dramatic as that but again that frantic scattered feeling of the writing definitely made you feel more unhinged and unbalanced than I would have expected from this book. Taib Sully is a very famous Sudanese writer and I would certainly read more that he wrote. This book was translated from the Arabic by Dennis Johnson Davies and I definitely really enjoyed it. I'm glad Glad to have read another book about Africa and African life and a different African country and I'm looking forward to reading more and that was the fourth book that I've read in April and when I read tomorrow I'll let you know it's April 15th and I have finished a one more book in April I finished the house on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros this is a Latin modern classic, I would say, or Latinx or Latinx American modern classic. It was written in 1984. It is a kind of auto fiction, semi autobiographical story told in vignettes about Esperanza, who is a young Latinx American girl living in California and it's all about how her family dreams of owning a house and moving out of all the apartments and rented houses that they've lived in and they eventually do get a house, the house on Mango Street, but it is not what Esperanza is hoping. It's not the house of her dreams or of her parents' dreams and it's all about her life living in this house and coming to the realization that even though you have hopes and aspirations they're not always going to come true. It's her kind of tale of moving from a child, a playful, free, unfettered child to a young adult and how she's kind of dealing with learning about her sexuality and learning hard lessons from the people in her neighborhood. This book is as much about her neighborhood and Mango Street, the people who live on it, the people that she interacts with, her friends, people who she admires, and people who she learns lessons from as it is about Esperanza and her family. This is told in like really short like little chapters, simple and plain in a lot of ways, almost except for a few hard-hitting topics I would say like domestic abuse and sexual assault, alcoholism, and drug abuse, almost told in a childish way or a way geared towards children. I would almost think this was a young adult book. It's not categorized as that but it could certainly serve as a young adult book but I think because there are those difficult topics they are 
it probably would be an older young adult book. Um, but then it's also told in this really like beautiful poetic way. The vignettes are sometimes very straightforward linear stories, but sometimes they're more almost poetic verse style stories. There was a couple of lines that I really liked. I wasn't like blown away by this story. I think it was an interesting look at growing up in a city environment and because it was told almost in verse in a lot of ways it was like little glimpses more emotional more feelings than storytelling i liked that aspect of it but it didn't really like connect to me in any great way or i didn't think it was any such brilliant story but definitely as a modern classic and a latinx modern classic I was super happy to have read this and I do highly recommend it. I think this would be a really good book for young people who are interested in poetry writing, are interested in verse, are interested in different experimental writings other than just novels. I would say that this and Black Flamingo, which I read earlier this year, could be good companions and could converse with each other. They kind of, to me, are linked in my mind in that young adult in verse kind of style of book. So I would definitely highly recommend this. I would also say to read it if you haven't read it. I think I've read a few modern classics from Hispanic writers recently that although they didn't blow me away and although I didn't love them, I think are definitely worth reading. That was the fifth book that I've read in April. I read Treasure by Oyinkan Braithwaite. She is best known as the author of My Sister the Serial Killer. This was one of the free books with a subscription, so this was a short story, and it was in a collection that I've read one other book from. I read Buried by Jeffrey Deaver. These are all like thrillers. Treasure follows a young want-to-be influencer in Lagos, Nigeria, and she is actually a housemaid, but she makes her life look very exciting and rich and exotic on her Instagram page and she's really hoping that this Instagram page and her being an influencer will launch her into a better life and if that means that she gets a lot of attention from men and sometimes they send her gifts or money she is okay with that. She will chat with the men a little bit and kind of keep them on the hook and unfortunately one of these men decide that he is going to marry her and he goes to look for her because because their online interaction has become not enough for him and he wants to find her and live the life that she is displaying online. I actually started this one a while ago. It's a very short audiobook. It's probably only about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, and it definitely has that thrilling, anticipatory, nerve-wracking kind of feeling that I don't love from books or movies or anything. So I started it and I would only read it like five minutes at a time. I'd read like 20 minutes of it and then five minutes of it and then feel that nervousness of knowing that something bad is going to happen and that these two characters are going to come together in possibly violent or upsetting ways. And I didn't, I just didn't want to know what happened, but I did want to know what happened. I really enjoyed Braithwaite's writing style and it made me more excited than ever to read her books. I would definitely highly recommend this one if you have that subscription or if you see this somewhere. Not only did it have that nerve wracking feeling, but I think it also had kind of a ambiguous moral slash more morality of characters which I really enjoyed so I would definitely recommend that one and then I read The Men and the Women by Nikki Giovanni. I actually found this in a Salvation Army this month. This is a book of poetry so I had never heard of Nikki Giovanni before but I looked her up when I saw this book of poetry because it looked interesting to me and she is an American poet still living today. She was influential in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and she's still writing now as far as I know. She's a contemporary of James Baldwin, and apparently there is a book or essay of or story of her and James Baldwin talking, so I would love to find that one. I didn't know anything about her before I got this book, and I didn't know what to expect from this book of poems, but it is called The Women and the Men. So it has a section of the women, and it has a section of the men, and it also has a section of 
and some places. The women's section of this is all poetry about womanhood, certainly, about physicality of women, of aging of women, of expectations of women. The men section is mostly love poems or unrequited love poems, uh, women talking to men, longing for men, sexuality between men and women, uneven nature of love, and then the last section and some places are specifically about multiple places. Africa, New York, the author lived in New York for a long time, um, Swaziland, Alabama, different areas that she went to and explored and how those places made her feel or poems about locations and her being in those locations. I'm not much of a poetry reader, um, but it is National Poetry Month in April, so it was kind of perfect timing to find it and it was a nice quick read. I read it over one day. The way I like to read poetry collections is to skim through them, read the poems that I'm most interested or most draw my eye first, put the book down for a little while, and then go back and read more of the poems, the next ones that catch my eye. And I have to admit that usually the last poems I read are the longest poems. A lot of times I don't really get poetry or I don't really understand the deeper metaphor or meaning. I think that these poems were fairly surface style, fairly self-explanatory, plain in that they are stating what they're stating. There's not like a ton of use of metaphor or there's not a ton of use of deeper meaning. I really enjoyed a lot of these poems. There were a lot of poems that I annotated and I did actually do a little video of me annotating some of them. So most of the poems, I didn't love the whole poem but there were lines or passages from the poem or stanzas from the poem that I specifically liked. So I was gonna read a couple of those to you here. So uh, the first one that I came across, the poem's name is The December of My Springs, and the area that I mark says, some say we are responsible for those we love, others know we are responsible for those who love us. A poem for a lady whose voice I like, and the passage that I highlighted was, Show me someone not full of herself and I'll show you a hungry person. So there was aspects of so many of these poems that I really enjoyed, even if, again, it wasn't the entire poem that was my favorite. This one is from the poem, The Way I Feel. I'm as glad as mortar on a brick that knows another brick is coming when you walk through my door. And this is the first poetry collection that I've annotated in this way, but I actually think that this would be a really good way to deal with poetry in the future. I also um, just mark some of the poems that I like, but then annotating these specific lines made me want to hold on to this poetry collection and revisit it later, maybe reread the whole poems or maybe reread just my favorite parts. And I definitely plan on looking out for some more of Nikki Giovanni's work. The next book that I finished was also another short story collection free from that subscription. But this one I don't think was like in a collection. I think it was a short story on its own. And I actually have to look up the author's name. It's by an Iranian author. And I am currently reading a book by another Iranian author. Thought it might be fun to, since I've never read any work from Iran, it would be fun to read a fiction as I was reading this nonfiction. So this book is called Parsnips in Love and it is by Porochista Kapoor. This is a short story, again it was about an hour and 20 minutes, about a farmer, an aged kind of elderly, well not um, getting to be elderly farmer, who is working in his fields one day and separating his vegetables because the people will only buy beautiful vegetables, so the non-beautiful vegetables he ends up eating. And he finds a pair of parsnips that are in a very evocative shape. He becomes obsessed with these parsnips and with the feelings that they manifest in him and with the emotions that they draw up. He becomes obsessed with the beauty of them as vegetables and as what they represent. 
and he kind of becomes overcome with emotion about what to do with these vegetables. He obviously can't eat them. They're, to him, they're more like a piece of artwork, and he obviously can't keep them because they're parsnips, so they're going to rot away eventually. So he kind of goes through a long adventure of when he can tell people about these parsnips and how he tells people about these parsnips, and what the repercussions of finding these parsnips are for him and his wife and his family and the people around him. This was a really interesting little short story, very sweet, very whimsical, very silly, a little bit emotional, a little bit erotic. It was interesting to read in comparison with the nonfiction book that I'm reading because that book also has quite a bit of whimsy and comedic elements to it and and this did as well so parsnips in love i think was slightly better written than the other book that i'm reading maybe a trait of iranian writing is that whimsy and romance romantic it was romantic it wasn't romantic in that it was like a romance between two people but it was a romanticizing of this man's life and his find of these um, evocative parsnips. I would love to read more by this author. It looks like Kapoor only has a few other books and one of them is a memoir of her being ill and that's not really that interesting to me but if this author did write more fiction I would definitely pick that up. And if I read some more this month I will definitely let you know. It is April 21st and I have finished one more book in April. I finished Honey in Farsi by Feruza Dumas. This is a memoir of growing up Iranian in America and Feruza moved to California in the 70s with her family. Her father worked for an Iranian oil company. He was a scientist and he was very happy to move to America. They thought they would only be staying for two years, but after those two years they returned to Iran and then moved back to California and ended up staying the rest of their lives. So this story is about Feruza's childhood, how she grew up with the cultural differences between Iran and America, how she eventually went to Berkeley, California to college, how she met her husband, and how she wrote this book. It's all framed through her family and the cultural differences that her family encounters, some of them funny and interesting and some of them racist and, and hard. And mostly the star of this book is her father, and she does even mention that in the end that although she was writing a memoir, her father really does star in this book. And I think it's an interesting look at how, although she and her mother were two women who didn't speak English, who came to America together, how much she really reveres and looks up to her father and how he, everything that they did as a family was kind of framed by him and his attitudes a lot of the time. Was that because of Iranian culture and family structure and dynamic? I don't know. Or was that just their particular family? I'm, I'm not sure. I did not love this book. The book is very much structured in short chapters where Feruza will bring up something that is funny or silly and then tell a story about her family, generally about her father, and then in the end that will come back around again. There's a lot of talk of them losing a lot of money after the Iranian Revolution and the kind of turnaround of America's views on Iran in the 70s and 80s. So when they first got to America, nobody really knew anything about Iran. And then when that happened, people definitely started looking at them differently and kind of being much more racist towards them. Never were they poverty stricken, never were they in so much uh, trouble or strife that they did they couldn't survive. There's a lot of instances where Feruza talks about how cheap her father is, but then also about how if she complained enough or if she got lost at Disney World or if something happened that he would buy her treats and 
a lot of their relationship was like reinforcing negative behavior with gifts and money and monetary things. And that just doesn't sit very well with me of like how to raise a child. I do think that Dumas is kind of using that as a funny anecdote, but it was kind of off-putting to me. I also felt that her humor isn't really the kind of humor that I would like. This book was written in 2003, so there were a few problematic language uses and terms and things like that that you can expect from a book that was written in 2003. I thought it was interesting to read. I'm glad that I read it. I think this would be Similarly to The House on Mango Street, I think this would be a good book to read with younger adults, young adults or young or older young people, teenagers or younger than teenagers. I think there's nothing harsh or upsetting in this book. There's definitely no strong language or anything like that. So I think this would be a good one to maybe relate some stories to older young people so that they could see what the immigrant experience is like or this particular immigrant experience is like. It is written in a very like, I always say this, but like simplistic way, like very basic writing, not very experienced writer, and that definitely shows. Versus The House on Mango Street, where I think she was an extremely experienced writer and a beautiful writer and had a lot of language and texture behind her writing, the way that The House on Mango Street was written was very simplistic. Whereas this, I think that this is a, a novice writer. She's not a writer by trade and she's not a creative, artistic writer in a lot of ways. And again, that's not necessarily bad. A lot of memoirs are not written that way, but I think that along with the other things that I disliked about this book, that definitely didn't help my experience of this book. Overall, I'm super glad to have read it. This was my TBR Tackle book for April, one that I've been wanting to get to for a while. So I'm glad to have read this one. And when I read some more in April, I'll let you know. It is May and I've read three books in April to round out the month. I read two volumes of poetry. My coffee shop that I work at has been doing a poetry reading every few weeks, which unfortunately I haven't had a chance to actually go and see, but I am excited to find that every time I go in after the poetry reading, there are more books left by local poets who had been at the poetry reading. So that is just super fun and I love that idea so much. I read two books of poetry from those poets. One was called A Candle Regaining Strength, and that was definitely a very amateurish uh, early work by a young poet. It had a lot to do with themes of growing up, of adulting, of not really knowing what that entails, of not feeling capable of dealing with the things that you have to deal with in transition from young person to adult. It had to do with love and loss and the idea that maybe being alone is easier than being in a relationship. It had a lot to do with memory and childhood memory and wanting to kind of go back to those times times and that ease and those ideas. It had a lot to do with moving, apartments, spaces, how when you're younger spaces hold certain magic and when you're older you have to pay rent. <laughs> Um, definitely was interesting. I, I liked reading it. I definitely plan on keeping my eye out for all these authors in the future and seeing what they do at this poetry reading and hopefully being able to go to the poetry readings and see some of them read their poetry because definitely some of this poetry seem like it should be read out loud. The next book of poetry that I read from these collections was called When Wolves Become Birds. So this was definitely a more feminist female selection of poetry. It had a lot to do with body imagery and body objectification and the idea of female bodies changing and growing, the idea of what makes a beautiful body, what makes an ugly body. Uh, it had themes and and motifs of claws, fur, nature, birds, flight, feathers, lightness, heaviness. It had less to do with like actual tangible reality things. Obviously the poems probably do gather back or go back to 
an idea of reality that the poet is trying to get across, but it was very much like in the imagery. It was very much forest and decay and leaves, trees, ground, dirt, claws, fur, hair, earth, and less about like feelings and uh, experiences and recollections. I liked the poems in this collection that were more in touch with actual reality best, I think. There was a couple of breakup poems, there was a couple of poems about the perception of being a woman and how you're perceived as a woman and how you are fearful as a woman. Those were the poems that I liked mo most out of this collection. As with the first collection, I think that this is a novice poet, but I do think that the first collection, this the poet was extremely amateurish and new and novice to poetry and writing in general, but could grow, certainly. And then in this second collection, When Wolves Become Birds, I think this one is obviously written by someone who's had more experience and more practice at writing poetry and at writing in general, but I think that the poems kind of all ran together and were not clear and distinct enough for someone who's written other works. Because I could tell that this person was more experienced, I expected more from her work and more in-depth, more commentary and less surface kind of imagery and themes. She works with Francesca Leah Block, which you can totally tell from her poetry, the style in which these poems are written. Now I used to love, love, love Francesca Leah Block. She used to be one of my favorite authors and she is a great, I think, an interesting young adult writer because her stuff is a little weird, and if you haven't been exposed to that as a young person, it's a good thing, and it's got queer themes, and it's got lots of different themes in it that maybe young people, especially in the 80s and 90s, like when I grew up, weren't getting exposed to as much in books. I think it's cool that this person worked with Francesca Leo Block, but like, I also think that maybe she needs some time to differentiate herself and move away from that similar style to be able to grow as a poet. So those were two poetry collections that I read and I enjoyed both of them. I would certainly love to read more and I would love to hear those people speak and congratulations to them that they wrote books and self-published books and now other people get to read their work. That is wonderful. The last book that I read in April was An African in Greenland by Tete Michael Kumbasi. This is a classic work of a non-fiction. It follows a young African man who was born and raised in Togo. He decides that he doesn't want to stay in his village and he doesn't want to lead the life that has kind of been set out for him in his village because in his particular area, all the different tribes have kind of different totems or spiritual associations, and he has been spiritually associated with one from a different tribe, and he's really not interested in going to this other tribe and becoming part of their philosophies. But what he does love is going to the library, and he finds a book on Greenland, and he becomes obsessed with the idea of traveling to Greenland and discovering this place in the world that's so different than his own, and it just becomes a driving passion that he can't ignore. He ends up leaving his family, traveling for many, many years to get to Greenland, and then living for several years in Greenland. This was one of the New York Review books that I was reading for New York Review Book April. This is the last one I was able to read. I was only able to read three of them, but I was most excited and interested to get to this one, and it was really, really fascinating. Again, in a way, it also reads as an amateur writer, it's hard to tell because this book was translated and it was translated by James Kirkup. So it's hard to tell if it was a translation that felt that way or if it was that this man was not a writer. He's not a author, he's not a writer, he's just a man who went from Africa to Greenland. So there is an unevenness to this book and an unevenness to the writing and a meandering kind of style to this nonfiction. It is definitely a memoir, but also definitely not a book that 
was super well planned out in that like, oh, now there's this section, now there's this section, now there's this section. It's much more fluid and realistic to life and what he's thinking about at the time, what his whims are, what is important to him to put down in this memoir and not a linear or detailed for every aspect or thesis thought out kind of book. So I did really really enjoy it and it's not that long, it's only like 300 pages. It's definitely worth a read if you're interested either in African culture or Greenlandic culture. It was written in the 70s so it definitely is quite dated now but it has a lot to say about colonization. Although Africa and Greenland are very different places, colonization takes away traditions and traditional ways of life in the same way everywhere. It has a lot to say about determination and the will to live and survive, but also the will to do something that you feel is worthwhile, which is what Michael is doing in this book. It uses the word Eskimo, even though in part of the text he says the indigenous Greenlandic people are not called Eskimos, and he does use the word Inuit, he still calls them Eskimos in the text for the most part and I think that's just because that was the accepted language at the time but it's definitely not the accepted language now so I found myself replacing those words a lot of time and other words that are outdated. I think most interestingly it's just about Greenlandic culture and how different Greenland is and how surviving in one of the coldest, harshest places in the world can be and how different it is from most people's experience, even someone who lives in a extremely hard to survive in region like Togo, Greenland is much much harder. I love the New York Review books because they always have something interesting. There's always something about the books that they choose as far as I can tell, that have a specialness, a spark, and this one is the same way. I have an article bookmarked that came out actually I think late last year, kind of catching up with Tete Michael and catching up with his journey since, because this book ends in a kind of abrupt way, so you don't really know like what the full outcome of his story is, and I would love to read more, so I'm excited to read that article. Those were the 12 books that I read in April. April felt very slumpy to me. I had a long portion in the middle of April where I felt like I wasn't reading a lot or I wasn't loving what I was reading or I wasn't feeling motivated to read and that really lasted almost until the last week of April and then I was able to finish this book and some of the other books that I read. I think reading those poetry books actually helped because they were such quick and easy reads for the most part but you had to be engaged with them in a very specific way and for a while before that point in April I hadn't been engaging very well so I was happy to have them help me on my way. But in the end it turned out to be a, a really great reading month. I was able to read my TBR Tackle book, I was able to read three of the New York Review books, and I loved all of them. I really had a great time reading these. Many of them I would like to reread. I don't know if I'd be rereading An African in Greenland anytime soon, but Seasons of Migration North and To Each His Own are ones that I've been thinking about a lot and I would definitely like to reread in the not too distant future. It was National Poetry Month and I was able to read two books of local poets and also Nikki Giovanni and this was the first time that I was introduced to Nikki Giovanni which was great. I also got to read a Golden Age mystery which is my favorite genre. It wasn't my favorite Golden Age mystery by any means but I did enjoy it. I was able to read some nonfiction and some auto fiction, and I read several novellas, both by authors that I would definitely read from again. I also was able to read Piranesi, which was the Women's Prize winner from 2021, and I really, really enjoyed that book. Overall, I think it was a totally great reading month. I definitely got to read quite a few diverse titles. I had a lot of great books by people of color, I had a lot of modern classics or those that fit into the modern classic time period. It was, it was a great reading month. It ended up being a great reading month. I already feel better and more on track in May and I think my reading in the end of April have helped me feel that way. I will be wrapping up all my readathons and everything that fits into that in my quarter two readathon review which will come out 
at the end of quarter two. Let me know what your favorite book that you read this month was. Let me know if you've read any of the books that I read here and would like to discuss them. Especially, I would say, Seasons of Migration North. If anyone has read this, I found this super interesting, so let me know. Or let me know if you read any New York Review books this month. I hope you had a great reading month. I hope if you're feeling slumpy, you get out of it like I did, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye!